This conference will now be recorded. No, I don't have anything from Commissioner Blockus, so I would assume that the commissioner is just running a few minutes late. Um, and since it's four and we've got three items on the agenda, we probably just want to get started and um, bring them up to speed when he joins. Okay. <clears throat> the July 27th, 2021 Planning Commission will come to order. Please call the roll, Julie. Commissioner Shower. Here. Commissioner Bluffus. Commissioner Atkins. Here. Commissioner Haroon. Here. Commissioner Schulte. Here. Vice Chair Pyle. Here. And Chair Liddell. Here. First up is um, approval of the minutes from the July 6, 2021 Planning Commission. Are there comments or changes to those minutes from the four of us that were here? If not, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll and I'm move to approve the minutes from the July, I'm sorry, what was the date again? Uh, July 6th. July 6th meeting. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that, Commissioner Haroon. It's been moved by Commissioner Atkins and seconded by Commissioner Haroon to approve the July 6, 2021 minutes. Please call the roll, Julie. Commissioner Shower. Abstain. Commissioner Bluffus. Commissioner Atkins. Approved. Commissioner Haroon. Approved. Commissioner Schulte. And I was not at the meeting, so I can't comment. Okay. Com um, Vice Chair Pyle. Abstain. And Chair Liddell. Approve. So we have three approve and anybody disapprove? So lacking a um, majority for approval, we will defer the approval of the minutes until the next meeting. Let me just ask, um, Becky Rude, are you on the phone? I just want to get a legal opinion on whether or not we actually need to defer it. We do have a majority of the commit. Well, no, we don't have a majority. Um, Becky, do you do we need a majority to approve the minutes? I believe so. I can verify and confirm. Okay, then we probably should just defer it to the next meeting. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. I have no communications from the chair. Rebecca, do you have anything? Uh, just a couple things, um, mostly uh, just logistics and administration. So just a reminder, please, to the members of the public who are attending um, and any others who are here for you know, one workshop or another, if you're not part of the current presentation, please mute yourself and please also turn off your uh, video um, until it's your, your time to participate. Uh, we just try to reduce visual clutter and, and make sure folks can see who's talking. Um, so just a reminder there. I also want to let the commission know that we are anticipating a return at this time to hybrid in-person virtual meetings in September. Um, we'll be sending you more information on that. Um, there is emerging, uh, new emerging guidance from the CDC about masks inside that came out today. So this could change. But as of right now, we are anticipating a return to in-person, um, hybrid in-person virtual meetings in September. Um, and um, we would still have protocols in place, social distancing, and there would still be the option for folks to both uh, tune in and, and watch virtually, but also provide public comment virtually. So um, we'll have more information for you on that um, as, as the guidance emerges. But wanted to, to let everybody know that. And that's all I have, Chair Liddell. Okay, so first up is our annual review of the comprehensive plan and zoning code text. And um, 
text zoning code and text changes. So Brian Snodgrass. Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, we've got a relatively short presentation, but we can uh, we can stop after, and I don't have built-in uh, pauses for you. But certainly after any of the items, we can stop and take questions. Um, I can have the first slide, please. So we wanted to do this earlier this this year than we have in the past. Uh, we've typically done this kind of an introductory workshop in, in um, September or August uh, to better ferret out those issues that need further analysis or uh, raise issues, need further workshop discussion. At this point, we we don't envision this as, as necessarily the final workshop for for these items. The um, so we'll as 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 mentioned, we'll uh, any questions you have uh, at any time are appropriate. And um, the list this year, is, as you can tell, is a little bit lower, this, lesser than in past years. We have one uh, just one privately submitted annual review request. Uh, we have one map cleanup change uh, that staff is sponsoring. Um, and at this point, nine code text changes, and so we'll we'll run through through those before you this afternoon. Next slide, please. So this is the annual review um, uh, from uh, DIRG for uh, a map change within the Section 30 area. It's to change. It's not to change the boundaries of the Section 30 subarea plan or implementing zoning, but to change the underlying zoning within from from ECX to. R18 and CC, uh, the applicants indicated a willingness to do MX perhaps instead of CC. It's about 28 acres. Um, and you can see on this map that the Western part of that is uh, proposed for R18. Uh, and in the application, the applicant indicates some flexibility there and they could go to a potentially a higher density. And the Eastern portion uh, to CC or MX, uh, the applicant also controls the area just to the South of, of this polygon here. Uh, essentially right, uh, just to the right of, of Southeast First Street, there's that square. Uh, they control that property. It's it's discussed in the application materials. It's indust it's ECX industrially zoned, so it's not proposed for a change at this time, so it's not shown on the map, but did want to call that to your attention. The, uh, and Section 30, uh, as you know, it has a sub-area plan. It has implementing zoning. Um, some of those issues were before you. Uh, which we'll discuss in a minute on a, a proposal that you you received and acted on this past spring, as well as other inquiries which staff is, is working through. Next slide, please. So that subarea plan was adopted in 2009. Uh, I included a link to it in the staff report. It's, it's always difficult to sort of summarize subarea plans in one or two sentences. Uh, in this case, th that I would say though, it, it envisions a, a major east side employment center. Um, with a focus on emerging technologies and family employment. The plan envisions 9,400 jobs over a fairly long period of time, 20 to 30 years, uh, and generally envisions a breakout predominantly for industrial and office uses, uh, and to a lesser extent with retail and commercial uses. There's also up to 1,800 housing units envisioned uh, in the sub area plan, um, uh, generally of, of, of a higher density, although not necessarily apartments. Um, and the subarea plan envisions those within two neighborhoods at locations to be determined through a master planning process. Next slide, please. And so there's uh, there uh, 2690 is the section of the code. I linked to that as well. That that has the requirements for uh, development within this area. Uh, a lot of those address that the ownership pattern is, as you know and, and will remember from the recent application is fairly. Fairly balkanized, there's a lot of owners there, and so a big part of, of the plan and the implementing zoning is um, to try and uh, coordinate that, um, particularly for infrastructure uh, and these other areas listed here. Um, the uh, zoning code makes optional the provision for, res for residential uses if they are to be provided, they, they, they are to follow the standards within the zoning, but it doesn't require those, um, and limits it to two within the, the section 30 sub area. Next slide, please. So the, uh, there is uh, development within the area and development interest. The uh, HP proposal uh, was before you this past spring. That was that, that didn't abut this this site directly. It was in the south uh, west corner of the of the uh, section 30, and uh, it was uh, approved by council. Um, the that proposal didn't have a residential component. It was up to a million and a half square feet of of office research development and other uses. The um, more recently and, and, and continually staff and, and not myself, but, but other staff who is 
uh, with us tonight if there's if we get into further questions about it has been engaged in, in discussions with uh, Gray Rock regarding a, a, a considerably larger development potentially in the, in the center and north uh, of this and abutting the uh, proposal tonight. Uh, 180 acres. Uh, the original idea there was for a, a housing mix with some industrial and follow-up discussions. The applicant has uh, talked about a, a broader mix of uses with some neighborhood commercial, some flex commercial industrial, perhaps even a park. Uh, discussions are ongoing. A formal application hasn't been submitted. Next slide. So the key issues uh, here are essentially uh, contextual. Or how, how does this application fit in with the Section 30 subarea plan and the implementing zoning standards. And uh, in terms of the broader goal of, of coordinated development of the um, of Section 30, uh, is, is, is the proposal ripe in terms of timing of the rezone given, given larger development emerging in the area? We, um, we did have a, a pre-application as we do with all annual reviews with, with the applicant um, who is, I, I would notice here tonight on the call. So if there's any uh, questions about the applicant's proposal or, or and so forth. Uh, I certainly encourage the, the commission to ask those questions. But the uh, what we indicated in the uh, pre-application in the sort of the, the summary following that was some concern about the ability of the proposal, at least as, as described at that point in the pre-application, of being able to meet the Section 30 um, standards and the implementing zoning. Um, uh, nonetheless, the applicant has has provided a formal application, which does include quite a bit more additional information. So that's still under review by staff. Um, but I think that the broader concern of whether it's right and or able to demonstrate consistency with the larger Section 30 standards, I think, is 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 going to be the issue. I think the, the the staff recommendation would turn on. And so with that, I will uh, uh, turn it back to the Planning Commission for any questions on on this particular proposal. Okay, are there questions on the first first uh, proposal that um, Brian has presented, uh, Mr. Pyle? Hi, Brian, um, on the on the zoning change designation, it, it, you know, it's the R19 and it's the MX or the CC. Are those um, two different parcels, or would we split zoning a single parcel? No, as I, it, it's it's two different parcels, and if we could jump back a couple of slides, uh, it will. Uh, one more, please, to get to the map. The uh, I'm, I'm going to well, what I will do is ask the applicant to qualify. But certainly the the CC or MX that's that's an existing parcel, and um, the I don't believe there's a splitting needed to in, incorporate the R18. Okay. Well, I guess we'll hear from the applicant on that. That's the only question I have at this time, Chair. Okay, we'll go around and then come back and have the applicant comment in case there's any other questions for the applicant. Commissioner Schauer. Yes, Brian, I'm a little unclear as to how the overall subarea of plan and stays in place when we change the zoning of parcels within the subarea of plan. My understanding is the subarea of plan only works if everything is zoned ECX. When you change the zoning of an underlying parcel, Maybe you can help me understand, are we letting them out of the subarea plan and then the entire code? Because the code is written for all ECX. I, I don't understand if you can help me, maybe I'm missing something. The, well, the, the application for the, I linked also to the applicant's materials and they include um, at least the applicant's assertions of findings of consistency with the subarea plan. The, um, the boundaries of the EC, of of this of section 30 and of the 2690 uh, are are set by code and the applicant is not the application isn't proposing to change any of those so um, the proposal would still be subject to the sub area plan and its implementing zoning it would have a different obviously a different underlying zoning if approved than the than than the ECX originally envisioned but but as a legal matter no it would still be in our view it would still be subject to the the subarea plan and the zoning that goes with it. The subarea plan, I guess, my is more maybe more technical. The subarea plan only con only contemplates one zone. And and the, as I understand the subarea plan, it contemplates everything within the subarea zone DCX. So I know that is a very deep document. I think it's about 40 pages. Is that 2690 code section? So. 
having singular parcels underneath the subarea zone, something other than ECX, I, I guess I'm concerned about how things function together and is it viable to be, a di you, something like you say it is, something zoned other than ECX in the subarea plan bound by 2690. So, and it, I don't have to answer today. I guess I, to me, it feels like it's inconsistent with the subarea plan to have anything other than ECX, which is all this is the only ECX in the entire state, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Schulting. I don't have any questions at this time. Okay. Commissioner Haroon. Yeah, I, I guess, Brian. Um, I would like to have a better understanding of what ECX zoning actually means because I'm I'm still unfamiliar with kind of the goal behind the sub area plan as far as what my understanding was it's more of a master plan and so we don't have a whole bunch of hodgepodgey stuff being developed but that there's like a guiding hand so to speak on what the city would like to see developed and my understanding is ultimately some kind of new you know city center hub live what live play work kind of area so i'm just a little um i guess i need a little bit more bookends for me on the boundaries to to, to really get a little better understanding does that make sense it does, and we we can provide that um, at at a, at a follow up workshop. The 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 list that right now the ECX is it is a zoning district, so it has its own list of of allowed uses and so forth. Um, but it, it is yes, it's entirely correct to say it, it only exists in section thirty. Um, I think Commissioner Shower is raising sort of legal question that we'll look into of that does it does that mean it simply has to say ECX period? or would development um, that had a different zoning but is consistent with the sub area plan and, and that's not yet determined that's kind of the crux issue here with this proposal but assuming it just for the sake of argument that it was consistent with the sub area plan and the implementing zoning could it have a different zoning designation so that's something we'll have to report back on so do we have kind of a overall concept of what we want it to be finished like like the the whole sub area like is there is there a kind of an overall like hey we want to have you know we've identified two parks uh walking trails everything has to tie together a certain way um there's got to be certain spacing between some of the commercial and residential and but it has to work together is there any thing like that like an overall master plan i guess I guess that's kind of what I'm... Not in the sense, say, of, of um, uh, the Vancouver Innovation Center, which, you know, which obviously was right. recently before the Planning Commission, where there was a guiding master plan. There is, there is within the sub area plan, which the staff report links to, very broad visual guidance. There's also a series of policies. There's the overall intent, um, which I've, I've tried to summarize here. It's, it's primarily an employment area. Um, with allowances for some residential requirements for master planning to coordinate the area, a recognition that there are different landowners there. Um, but it, it, there's not a, a visual master plan in, in the same way that exists in, in the subway plan. And I'm going to also invite either Rebecca or Mark to, to jump in with, uh, with any further background on Section 30 that I'm missing. Yeah, I'm help, happy to jump in briefly, um, and Mark, feel free to uh, follow up with anything I missed. But there's, there is, I mean, so the the overall vision is the vision articulated at the sub area plan, you know, sort of level. So it addresses the key elements of um, sort of the mix of uses, the sort of uh, conceptual uh, transportation infrastructure, so like the roadway network at a, at a high level. Um, it looks at sort of some of the. This is an area with sort of serious, significant infrastructure challenges um, related to the grade differentials, stormwater management. Um, it, so it, it goes into some detail and from a policy at a policy level about how those things need to be coordinated. Um, it does not identify the specific locations of different uses, um, but it does um, you know, clearly you know, intend to 
it, it does clearly have an intent around housing that it be limited to kind of two key areas generally located in what are called um, urban neighbor, neighborhood overlays that would be limited to a specific acreage and that would be integrated in sort of these um, neighborhood center, you know, with neighborhood serving commercial in them. Um, and that, you know, generally this would all be connected from, in, from a multimodal and, and vehicular transportation standpoint. So the, the, the sub area plan really is the, the level of vision that we have. Um, and each individual project that comes in um, is required to have that master plan that, that goes into, I think, the more detail that you're, you're, you're asking about, Commissioner Haroon, um, as you saw, like say with the HP master plan um, that came, that Mark and uh, Mark Carson brought through um, a few months ago. So I hope that's helpful, but it's really at the sub area plan level. Okay. Yeah, this is my, my, my concern. What I'm trying to say, like, are we just kind of leaving it to, to chance and it's going to be hodgepodgey and it's the, the, the first people in to get their, their housing or to ask for housing, they're going to get the housing. And the ones afterwards are like, well, no, we already have all that housing met. So that was kind of the. Okay. Yeah. And I'll ask Mark to jump in here, but I just want to be clear that in. So one, no, it's not going to be left a chance. Um, the full, the, the, the requirement for master plan and for a full site utilization plan is the sort of coordinating implement that will facilitate coordinated development of, along or, or sort of as, as individual landowners make decisions about what to do with their properties. In terms of the housing though, um, that does envision two areas with housing and a maximum sort of acreage for target. And I think that depending on who's in first, that they, they will, there is a, a, Mark, please speak to this, but my understanding is there is a limit to the amount of housing envisioned in here and that folks can choose to take advantage of those neighborhood overlays while they exist. And once they are done, there, there, there will not be an ability to add additional housing unless there is some pre-agreed upon um, DA. Some of these properties do have pre-annexation, pre-sub area plan DAs that may allow them to do more housing or a little bit more housing than what the plan envisions. But generally, you're, you're correct. First in who select utilizing the housing would be able to utilize that and once it's gone there would not be other opportunities mark please is that correct yeah rebecca i think you you hit the nail on the head and commissioner Haroon, i guess i would just say the the ecx does live in our industrial uh use table i mean this area is envisioned as employment first from what i understand with you know complementary commercial and housing but but basically you know the the vision is employment industrial first thank you commissioner atkins i have none at this time i had some of the same questions as commissioner haroon but it sounds like we'll get that some of that detail in the future yeah i think we will have further discussion on this you said mr housley is here representing the applicant yes so, so Mr. Housley, are you there? Yes. Uh, good. Good afternoon, planning commission members. Um, first, I wanted to, I guess, pivot and go to uh, Commissioner Shower's question. Um, I, I think uh, with, with, uh, we'll, we'll come back with a, a more formal answer uh, with, with that, Tim, um, during the, the formal hearing. But uh, as Brian sort of alluded to early on, when we we discussed this we we did recognize that uh you know there's a lot of things afoot right now with the, the city uh, in terms of planning for this area including some some transportation planning that's that's going on and therefore the the ripeness of this may not necessarily be be this year but uh with that being said there's been a lot of interest in in this particular property uh, in general, um, and we're just finding that the, the ECX zoning as it is currently constituted doesn't necessarily lend itself uh, really all that that great to to um, being a workable zoning district for for developers. And therefore, we uh, sort of are viewing this application as 
taking that that part of it and breaking it apart in the separate uh, pieces that that um, developers are more familiar with and can readily develop the project. And the important thing about this this uh, property from a locational standpoint is it is going to be one of the, the gateways into the entrance of the, the full rest of Section 30 because we do have the lighted access off of 192nd uh, currently across from the, the development with Costco as well as uh, there'll be an additional access point off of uh, First Avenue um, into the, the, the bulk of the the section 30 and we we have been talking with our adjacent uh, property owners to uh, try to to find workable areas to move the the roadway and circulation stuff and you know they're they're very on board and supportive of, of this this request and um, I, I think that this may spur additional uh, conversations within within the area and going forward um, the main concern with uh, the ECX in, in terms of what we're attempting to do with uh, the housing and, and of course we're not necessarily opposed to uh, you know a more dense zoning designation there is that unfortunately the ECX requires that uh, all housing be uh, above the ground floor and e even if you look to the the development to the south in the Columbia Tech Center uh, that that's not how the the housing product has developed. It's it's you know clearly just a standalone uh, multifamily with uh, that that separation between the the other land uses of office, commercial, and industrial. And again, therefore, we're that that's what we're sort of similarly seeking to, I guess, be the next the next uh, area of development as um, uh, you know 192nd corridor uh, develops out. So, uh, Commissioner Pyle, uh, are have your has is your question been answered by the applicant yet? No, I I was specifically seeking clarity on whether the request is to split zone. I know that there's two different parcels per your report. Is are you separating those parcels um, or separating the zones by parcel or or more by geometry? Uh, more more by by geometry in the way that I'm I'm sort of viewing this is more by where the roadway location would be and kind of using um, that that potential you know collector level street or it, you know maybe a minor arterial street for for mr schulte's purposes um, as uh, sort of a natural break point between uh, the, the various land uses and so you know they're on 192nd avenue uh, keeping that as as a commercial or you know office or retail use uh, make makes sense, um, you know, maintaining that employment use along uh, First Street uh, as well sort of makes sense. But uh, again, uh, being able to use that that roadway as a, a natural break for where the, the residential would occur. And that that's kind of, um, it, it's a little bit hard to describe, but this is an old uh, gravel pit. And so the, the slope is, is kind of um, at at street grade and then it goes it goes down quite a ways to that that back northwest corner of the property so uh brian given we have uh many slides yet to go we know that this discussion is going to be continued and brought back right this That's particular right. This is an initial introduction to to the issues uh the the, the, the project the proposal the applicant and and the issues at least that staff is looking at yeah okay so let's move on for now on to the next ones the the other map change is, is a correction uh sponsored by city staff uh a little bit hard to see at this scale it's it's essentially to an area that um uh, was changed to industrial zoning um, in 2007 um, and should have been changed at that time to eliminate a greenway overlay, uh, but was not. And um, the the property is owned by the port. We, uh, port staff representatives are are with us tonight. If there's questions about about the history or the use of the property, um, but it's it's essentially a map cleanup from staff's perspective, and so we're the city is sponsoring it. 
And the, this shows the underlying zoning. It's a little hard to tell at the scale. The, the blue is industrial. And so you can see where the tip of the arrow is. That's where the property is. It, it's a good sized property, about 50 acres. The, um, uh, some of this area, it, most of the brown area is, is the coterminous with city limits. So uh, you've got city zoning here at the edge of, of city zoning. Some of that is, is within the county. The, the purplish blue portlands below are, of course, within the city. Next uh, slide, please. And so this this is in black and white, a little little easier to see what's going on. Highlighted in, in the bold outline is is the property itself. Yeah. Um, and here you can, you can see the greenway zoning um, on, that's on both sides of the property. The um, uh, and removal of the greenway zoning on this site, as as should have happened in the past, would would leave two parts of the greenway from a zoning perspective, but. Um, that's that's inherent in the in the change that was made to industrial. Next slide, please. And so this this shows the actual mapping to be changed. It, it's because it's an overlay. The map is actually in it's part of the city zoning code, and this highlights highlights it there. It highlights the broader greenway zoning. And so the change would simply be to this figure to eliminate the greenway overlay from from the port parcel seven outlined here. Next slide. And as mentioned, uh, this this dates back to the change in zoning in 2007, um, which which was not brought the, the Greenway District with, for for reasons that are unclear. And looking at the record, the Greenway District wasn't uh, similarly changed in zoning. And um, if a zone change here is is approved, as as, as staff is is likely to recommend, then it wouldn't, of course, eliminate environmental protection. The, Future development on the site would need to go through SEPA. It would need to conform to the city curricular area protection standards and, and any other standards. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to your, your questions. And we've got, um, as mentioned, both port staff with us and also uh, city development review staff as well, if there's questions about critical areas protection. Given that a representative from the port is here, uh, would one of you like to add anything to what Mr. Snodgrass has outlined? Hi, this is Kathy Holtby. I'm the real estate manager for the Port of Vancouver, and uh, it has been adequately, um, you know, outlined by Mr. Snodgrass. Uh, it this was part of the Roofner Farm. Um, the first phase of the development was the Centennial Industrial Park, which was 58 acres, and this was is planned to be the second phase of light industrial development similar to the current development in um, phase one. And uh, so we went, as we were going through this, we came across this uh, inconsistency in the zoning codes and uh, online and um, were concerned. So in, in follow-up discussions um, with Mr. Snodgrass and um, others, uh, it, it was revealed and, and determined that it was uh, um, just something that did not get changed in 2007 when the rezone from agricultural to uh, in light industrial was completed. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions from commissioners? Commissioner Atkins? None for me at this time. Sorry. Commissioner Haroon? No questions. Commissioner Schulte? No questions. Commissioner Schauer? Yes, Brian, maybe, or if any of the staff can answer, is this property under any other approved entitlements from the city of Vancouver? Is it in the Centennial Master Plan? Does it have any other entitlement other than it's currently being zoned IL? Not that I'm aware of, and looking at the record, um, Kathy may know better, so I, I, let's. And, and the, the, thank you. The, the point of my question is, if the city has already granted some other entitlement, this feels almost obligatory on our part and less uh, sort of a subjective decision to make. Uh, but I, there are not that many vacant 50-acre industrial parcels that represent sort of economic development and job creation. So I think it's quite important to uh, get there. So I just wanted to understand what the record beyond the zoning is. If there's any other secured entitlements that are binding upon the city? 
Um, this is Kathy again. Uh, I, I'm, I would have to uh, look back at the initial uh, development agreement with this that we have on phase one. Uh, I do know that at the time of the discussion and the development of the Roofner Farm, this was and has been always identified as um, the par parcel that is planned to be developed uh, for light industrial along with um, the initial one that is that has currently been developed. Uh, the current um, Centennial Industrial Park is, I believe, is somewhere between 250 and 300 jobs uh, uh, with the current tenants that are there. And we still have um, some about three lots to develop um, and, and obtain new tenants for uh, or businesses. So this would be a continuation of, of that same uh, type of development. Thank you. Commissioner Pyle. No questions, thanks. Okay, so Brian, go ahead and go through all the other ones and then we'll have questions after you finish those nine. Certainly, next slide please. So there's uh, there's nine code text changes. We we have not at this point identified any comprehensive plan text changes. The um, and I should say the, these are code cleanup items that they you know as, as you're well aware there are other potential code changes particularly in, in regarding housing and other uh, other aspects which are being considered. But in, in terms of the, the cleanup items going forward as a bunch, the, this is where it stands at this point. The uh, and the staff report has has specific language. This is just a summary of it, but uh, just quickly moving through the uh, a fee revision, um, a technical change essentially to reflect that uh, Portland consumer price indexing is no longer tracked by the federal government. So the revision would be to uh, defer to Washington based indices. The uh, uh, changes in the vesting of applications, the second bullet to reflect uh, appropriate terminology used in applications. Um, Changes to final plat language to rep reference surveyor certification, um, similar to what, to what state law calls for and what other jurisdictions do. The uh, changes to in um, the technical standards of subdivisions to eliminate septic systems, which are not allowed. And um, changes to uh, a reference to infill in the single family zone listing of minimum and maximum densities Infill essentially has its, its own standard, so it's probably not appropriate to list there. Next slide, please. Changes in the industrial use uh, table um, to eliminate what's implied at least as an allowance of, of mixed use uh, residential buildings in the OCI and IL zone, um, which the MX standards uh, don't allow. Uh, changes to um, language, uh, again to reflect appropriate application terminology regarding fences and walls. Um, changes um, to plan developments, I think there's a typo there, um, uh, to clarify the uh, when sound walls can and can't be applied. Um, and uh, lastly a change to um, in the infill standards to relationship to other development standards just to correct a cross reference to some of the transportation standards that have it had the the number wrong. Um, the again, this is this is the this is the list as it stands. It's um, as you remember from past years. It, it's in, in some cases some of these are modified as we we go forward. This won't be the last workshop. Um, I became aware today, for instance, of the need to change our uh, Brian Rowe of our our staff caught this that our annexation lookup table relative to Clark County zones, the corresponding city zones, is out of date. So we'll. we'll Next time we're before you on this, we'll include that in this bunch. It doesn't change the policy of, of trying to match the zone that Clark County has when it's annexed. It just changes some of the references to zones which, which in the county don't exist anymore. So um, there may be some other other uh, modest changes as this goes forward, but it's it's overall it's a shorter and simpler list than in previous years. So next slide, I believe that's all we have in terms of text changes, and we'll turn it back to your questions. Um, again, in terms okay. of scheduling, we don't have one yet. Um, we'll schedule additional workshop time as needed as these issues develop, and, and of course, schedule a hearing as yet, which we haven't done. Let's go back to slide 12, and we'll go around and I'll ask if there are any questions regarding the 
zoning code text changes with that first group. Commissioner Pyle. I just a question on the first one. Just want to clarify that 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 CPI tracking that doesn't have anything to do with you know the affordable housing tracking that is utilized for the multifamily tax credit, correct? Uh, I'll need to confirm, but I don't believe so. It's it's probably just for construction pricing. Uh, okay, great. That's all I have. Commissioner Shower. Uh, no, I don't have any questions other than to state that I've reviewed all the changes. I find them all, uh, I'm, I'm lean towards favor, favorable approval of these. And I don't personally have a need for another workshop on these items. So if there's a moment to accelerate this to approval, if Brian's got other things to add, I would advocate um, no need for additional workshop for me. Thank you. Commissioner Schulte. Uh, to, to me, they're all very straightforward, needed, and uh, I don't have anything further at this time. Commissioner Haroon? I have, I have no questions. Okay. Commissioner Atkins? I have no questions this time. I would just uh, reiterate um, what Commissioner Schauer said. I'm, I think I'm pretty clear on it. I don't really think that we have a need for another uh, workshop. So. I agree as well. I I think the uh, nine zoning code text changes outlined there uh, are straightforward and needed. Going back to the uh, first discussion, I think, Brian, you heard some, some skepticism or at least um, definitely a call for more clarification and some detail on the, on the first one relative to the app, the DIRG and the 28 acres. So do you want to clarify any of the questions that we had regarding that or? No, I think we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you in, in, in a further workshop. Um, I, I think there, there was the, the broad questions I think relate to the, the consistency of the proposal to those standards. Um, and then there was, was the, the more specific question about uh, whether removal of the ECX is um, basically that cannot be done without also removing that area from being subject to the sub area plan. Yes. Sir, if, if I may, it's, I just want to. Yes, go ahead. It, it sounds like, um, thank you. It sounds like uh, also might be helpful to just review sort of in, at a high level, the, the sub area plan and the sort of key components of the ECX zone. Um, is that, I know we gave you know, a short summary, but is, is that something that would be helpful as part of the next workshop as well or? Yes, I think so. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, no further questions on this. We are ready for the updates to the fossil fuel storage facilities with Aaron Landy. And Chair, if I may um, just give a couple introductory comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just wanted to remind the commission that this is the second workshop on the fossil fuel infrastructure regulations and proposed changes. Uh, first workshop was on May 25th and following the discussion today, we're anticipating coming forward um, with a public hearing on September 14th. Um, so uh, also just kind of want to set the stage that this is something that was initiated um, and directed by the city council um, based on public health and safety. Um, and so that's the context that, that we're operating in as staff bring this forward. Um, and with that, I will ask Mr. Landy to please take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon to uh, the commission. Uh, I think we can move to the next slide. Again, Aaron Landy, Policy Program Manager. Nice to be with you this afternoon. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna try to bounce a little bit between slides. So I'm just going to quickly uh, remind the commission to sort of the background context, what was previously discussed at the last workshop, kind of where we, how we've gotten to where we are now. Uh, and just gonna, again, go over the initial staff recommendation. Uh, the meat of this workshop, the intention here is to respond to the questions uh, asked by the Planning Commission in the last workshop. So uh, you asked some questions that required additional uh, research and 
and and consultation with with some of my colleagues. So I went back, found the found the answers as best I could, and and here they are to now. And then uh, I'll just wrap up with the next step, some of which uh, Rebecca just mentioned. So next slide, please. So just a reminder where we're at and why we why we proposed this uh, this moratorium that now we're working towards uh, developing uh, 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 amendments to uh, the code. Uh, definitely, there's a concern uh, within the community, within the council, that the development of new or expansion of existing large-scale fossil fuel facilities is contrary to the health, safety, and welfare of Vancouver's citizens. Uh, and we believe that uh, taking this action supports the adopted goals of both the city strategic plan as well as this comprehensive plan, those goals including ensuring a safe, environmentally responsible, and well-maintained built environment, managing the development uh, in geologically hazardous areas to protect public health and safety, uh, promoting and facilitating alternative energy sources and gen generation, and then lastly, ensuring safe and adequate drinking water supplies. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the rationale for why we're doing the work we're doing. Next slide, please. Uh, just a reminder of the definitions of, of kind of what we're talking about, and on the next slide will be kind of what we're not. Uh, fossil fuels, petroleum and petroleum products, uh, as well as coal and natural gases. And uh, natural gases, we're talking about methane, propane, and butane. Uh, all of these fossil fuels are ones that are derived from prehistoric organic matter and used to generate energy. Uh, when we talk about large-scale fossil fuel facilities, we are talking about facilities that are engaged in the wholesale distribution, extraction, refinement, or processing of fossil fuels, the terminals engaged in the bulk movement of fossil fuels, the bulk coal storage facilities, coal power plants, natural gas processing, storage, and handling facilities, and bulk storage or one, of one or a combination of multiple types of fossil fuels in excess of 2 million gallons. And I know we have a couple of questions coming up uh, to a few of the aspects, especially of this definition of large scale fossil fuel facilities. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to clarify any, uh, any questions that uh, result from this definition. Next slide, please. So exclusions, and you know, I think this is, this is an important point to make. Uh, this, is, this is definitely the direction of, of the council as staff worked on this is, is what to be excluded from from this, uh, this effort. So the fossil fuels definition does not include byproducts of, of fossil fuels, such as asphalt, plastics, fertilizers, paints, or uh, denatured ethanol. Uh, large scale fossil fuel facilities does not include facilities that provide direct sales or distribution to customers. So they were very clear gas stations would not be included under here. Uh, facilities that create energy from landfill gas, uh, rail yards, and then fuel storage for airports or marine servicing facilities. Those all would not be included here under uh, this large scale fossil fuel facilities. Next slide, please. So just a reminder, the initial staff recommendation is that per the direction we received from council, we will look to amend the Title 20 Land Use Code to prohibit new and expansion of existing large scale fossil fuel facilities in all zoning designations. We would use the definitions that I just ran through for both fossil fuels as well as large scale facilities consistent uh, with the moratorium. So that definitions I just walked us through. And we would prohibit the expansion of existing large scale fossil fuel facilities. This is the same approach that was used in 2014 to restrict the expansion of crude petroleum facilities. So just really looking to expand uh, the work done in 2014 to, to be more uh, inclusive of all fossil fuel facilities. Before I get to the questions, and maybe this is premature, but I will say, I'll stop here and see if there's any questions on sort of the slides I just uh, quickly walked through uh, before I get to the answers to your previous questions. Okay, Commissioner Schulte. Aaron, I've got just a very general question and I'm very interested in this work. And I, I guess my big picture question, um, assuming this moves forward, it's, it's adopted by city council, how do you how do you sell this to our community? How do you how do you get the support it needs to have for it to move forward? Uh, is there active thinking on that topic? Um, I mean, I have my own ideas for that. I have not talked with uh, the city council if they have particular ideas of how uh, they intend on messaging this themselves uh, to the broader 
uh, community. Um, you know, so so I will speak from my own personal uh, opinion as one of many people that will have to talk about this. And I would really focus on the health and safety uh, aspects of recognition that we do live in a, uh, a seismically active area. Uh, and, you know, I think it's reasonable to assume that uh, a large scale seismic event is going to happen. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when, uh, and that we want to uh, protect our health safety uh, as best we can. And, and this is one way to, to do that. So that's that's the direction I would take. Like I said, I'm not sure you know what, what council is thinking about in terms of their own messaging. Again, I think it is it's it's a key question for the project moving forward is how how do you I call it activate people and and get it out there for people to to uh, to address. It's really critical. Thank you. Definitely agree. Commissioner Thank Haroon. You. Commissioner Haroon. Yeah, well, I, I think I think some of my questions might be answered when when he's um, responding to our previous questions. But I do I I have a um, the methane. So so methane's derived um, methane that's derived from like the sewage treatment plant. So if if there was a partnership with like Northwest Natural capturing the methane from um, I know there's a proposal on the table for that to capture the city of Vancouver wastewater gas, um, would that be then prohibited or does that fall under landfill gas? I would uh, I would see it as falling under landfill gas since it's the same uh, gas for the same capture reason, uh, producing, producing of renewable energy. Uh, I actually, as I read landfill gas on that previous slide, I thought about making a, a spur of the moment addition of of, of the wastewater treatment facilities, recognizing that we are, you know, definitely exploring that. And that was actually something that was discussed by council just last night uh, to, to continue that exploration, those conversations. So um, I, I, I think I think council's interest in seeing that conversation continue would, you know, is, is the direction we need to know that it's not being uh, included here under these, uh, under this, under this uh, code amendment. Thank you. Commissioner Atkins. Uh, yeah, I had a similar question to Commissioner Haroon. Um, Eugene Water and Electric Board, together with Northwest Natural Gas, is exploring a technology down in Eugene whereby they take uh, excess renewable el electricity and use it to generate hydrogen or create hydrogen rather and thereby store the hydrogen and then mix eventually in the future mix or over time mix the hydrogen into their natural gas stream so the idea is that the, the hydrogen was was created uh, via renewable green electricity you're essentially using it as a storage mechanism how, how would this how would that technology play into this um I think we'd have to see what is proposed once it's proposed here in Vancouver. Uh, I think yeah. I think we we would That's just. That's why I'm I'm just just, kind of just as a knee jerk reaction. I'm I'm kind of opposed to just blanket moratoriums because you have an unintended consequences of prohibiting technology that we may not even fully understand now. So there's an example of you know it's it's rel it's, it seems like a green technology. Because you're just taking excess renewable electricity and creating hydrogen, uh, there's no downside to the creation. And here we've created an impediment to uh, helping foster that kind of idea. I mean, there are probably lots of ideas we haven't even thought about. You know, so, it's I a always good think question. That the moratoriums are kind of a, a hammer for trying to kill a fly. And I appreciate that. Um, I would actually be curious, and I and I believe uh, David Gallison is is on. At least I thought I saw him earlier on the call, uh, who's the staff attorney helping me with this. I I wonder if this actually this moratorium or this this code amendment would have a uh, would cover um, the creation of hydrogen or hydrogen products since those are being created not from fossil fuel uh, 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 as as defined as being. Um, let me make sure I have the language correct. Uh, derived from prehistoric organic matter, uh, you know, and that's why the question, why I would say my answer would be, I'd have to sort of understand better the process by which they're 
creating the, the hydrogen, but if it's not being created through the, you know, by derived from prehistoric organic material, then it wouldn't be covered here and it could still move forward. So uh, I think that's why my, my answer still would be, I would need to understand better the process and what they're proposing here in Vancouver. The, the other question I have, which is more global, and maybe we don't get into this, but is how what is the projected need over the next, I don't know, 10 to 20 years on the West Coast for fossil fuel facilities? I mean, if we're still going to be driving cars and we still need to have someone deliver gas to the gas station, are we just, by preventing them here, sending them to another community down the road? I mean, is there still a, there's still a West Coast regional need for these facilities. As much as we might want to be green, there's the recognition that there's going to be a, a phased-in transition period. And what's the need West Coast-wise? It just seems that, again, again, these moratoriums where we just say, we're not going to allow these here, but I'm going to drive down the street and go fill up my car. I'm just pushing it down to another community that may not be able to create a moratorium versus maybe we just manage it better and i and i appreciate the question i have i am in no position to be able to respond to to a question about the the west coast uh fuel fuel system but again i mean these are these are these are really regional facilities right i mean any any facility that meets this definition that exists in vancouver right now isn't serving just vancouver is that correct i mean we have we, i mean we're not we must have a handful of these facilities that meet this definition that exist over in West Vancouver right now. Uh, I believe there's right. five facilities that meet this definition as we as staff was able to determine. Okay. And and are those are those businesses serving only Vancouver or do they serve the region? It's actually unclear from our research. I mean, we, we did not reach out to the individual businesses. We were going off of uh, tax records and other, you know, land use records. So uh, unclear kind of how regional well, region I would I would suggest maybe for the for the next for the next meeting maybe just ask those five businesses that we're proposing to put out of business over over time are they regional businesses or do they just serve this and and if, again once they go out of business where does that where does that use get served from sure we can we can look into that just out of curiosity how many employees work at those five businesses I I am not I'm not, I, I would not be able to answer that at this time. Any idea what sort of tax revenue those five businesses pay into the city of Vancouver coffers? Nope, I do not know. Again, I think long-term, this is the right direction to go. Short-term, we just ought to think about the unintended consequences. I understand. We will continue to investigate. Commissioner Pyle. Thanks. Commissioner Schauer. Thank you. I, I would say, um, Aaron, this is a good piece of work. There's a lot of there's a lot of detail here, and I think I am philosophically aligned with the need to get away from fossil fuel. So I don't want to be I don't want to be heard as saying we don't need to reduce our carbon footprint. My concern would be, and I'll just express that's a question, express an opinion. I don't think an outright prohibition is a viable tool in a, in a dynamic energy environment. There are technologies changing all the time. And I'll call us back to a prohibition or a mandate for renewable energy in Washington for 15% of all the power companies. And yet we change the definition of what renewable looks like. You know, hydro is not renewable, now it is renewable. It's dynamic. And I might suggest foreshadow a recommendation in the future outright prohibition alternative to that would be every one of these that meets your definition is a type four approval which goes to council so that if if there is something to atkins atkins, Mr. atkins comments or some others if there's something that makes sense that is a that moves the ball forward for less fossil fuel consumption and it could happen here in vancouver that we'd want to encourage it then council can make that decision in the moment, but it is a subjective decision at a type four level as opposed to an outright prohibition. And I'd hate to have a moment where it's outright prohibited in the code and it's something that council wants to approve and makes sense, but we can't do it. Or it, it, you know, I'm just, 
it is binding future councils to a technology that's drastically changing at the moment. And as an infrastructure, a person who's committed their career to infrastructure, nobody wants a sewer treatment plant, a dump, a gas station, or any of the other things in their neighborhood or in their community, yet we all need them. So I think every community carries its share of societal responsibility for infrastructure. And I would trust in our city council case by case decision. So that would be my that's my foreshadowed perspective. I couldn't I couldn't critique any of your language. I think it is solid other than type four versus prohibition. Thank you. Thank you. I just like to add Commissioner Shower Com said my Commissioner point, Atkins. But much more yeah, uh, Commissioner Shower made my point but much more eloquently. I I, I think the uh, I just want to reaffirm I, I agree with what he just said. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, uh, then I will advance the next slide, please. All right. So now the questions. So there was a question about we reference natural gas processing, storing, and handling, and what does that mean? So within the context of land use, business, occupation, tax uh, context, processing typically refers to an activity where labor and skill is applied to some material in order to change it in some way that makes it more useful or more valuable. Uh, storing would be something other than processing it, typically just holding it between transportation points. And then handling uh, is a little bit of a looser definition from my understanding uh, in our my conversation with the staff attorney. Uh, covers any activity where a product passes through but is not changed enough to be considered processing, but is not held long enough to be considered storing. And the example that I was given was a UPS driver, for example, handles packages, but they're not generally processing them, not adding any value to them, and hopefully not storing them. So typically when you write this kind of language, you include all three of these activities just to include all possible activities under one uh, under one big umbrella. So that's hopefully uh, an accept a good answer for that uh, good question. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, there was a question about how to interpret the moratorium definition and specifically section 1B of the moratorium uh, and subsections A through G of section 1B of the moratorium uh, for anyone who's curious, I mean, page seven of the moratorium uh, should be read, those subsections A through G should be read as or statements and subsection G specifically is specifying in excess of 2 million gallons threshold that should be read as an other category to cover types of fossil fuel not specified in the above provisions. And so this interpretation would mean that it covers uh, what would be considered a large scale fossil fuel facility across various industries and operations, but doesn't needlessly encompass others that shouldn't be subject to these regulations by establishing that 2 million gallon threshold. So uh, we're trying to uh, have a little bit of leeway there uh, just to allow for, for facilities that uh, would, would hopefully not be entrapped, but might be trapped by, by this uh, definitions. Next uh, slide, uh, there was a question about the significance of the 2 million gallons as the storage threshold. Uh, it appears that based on research, these regulations uh, were based off of regulations developed by the city of Portland a few years ago. And the 2 million gallon threshold, it's, uh, it was established at that point to, so that it would include facilities that are large enough to unload uh, those large 70 unit trains, which typically hold 3 million gallons. So the idea is that we would we would encompass uh, those those facilities that might be serviced by those large unit trains uh, in in our in our definition of a large fossil fuel facility. Next question, next slide. Uh, there was a question about how many years would a spill impact a wellhead, uh, and the answer I received from our uh, our our water folks, is that this is not an easy question to answer. Uh, it have to be modeled with a groundwater computer model, and that's dependent on many different factors, including the type of fuel that was spilled, how much fuel was released, uh, how hard we are pumping that particular wellhead, uh, specific soil conditions of that area, and then other factors as well. Uh, there's so many variables that would need to be modeled that it's just not an easy answer. You know, We can't really just say it's going to be three years that a spill would impact a wellhead. Uh, it'd really be 
wellhead specific and require a, a, a large amount of modeling. Next slide, please. And the question of can existing facilities be replaced under, uh, under this proposed amendment? And would the consolidation of existing facilities be allowed on site? So existing facilities can be replaced and or consolidated. Uh, I think you know, the determining factor when making that determination would be that the maximum allowable storage capacity for the site. So if example, if a site has three uh, 1 million gallon tanks on it, when the ordinance takes effect and operationally and safety wise, uh, the owner decides that it would make sense to consolidate, consolidate them into one 3 million gallon tank, uh, that would be allowed. So if they have three on one that goes into effect, move it together, that's fine. However, if the same site has one 1 million gallon tank on day one of the ordinance and then buys the site next door that has 1.5 has a 1.5 million gallon tank on it, you can't consolidate that into a single 2.5 million gallon tank because those were two, at the day the ordinance went into effect, those were two different sites and they cannot be combined into, uh, into one 1.5 million, two, excuse me, 2.5 million gallon tank. The idea with this action is that the city is setting capacity limits as of the certain date that the uh, the amendment goes into effect. And after that date, there can always be less capacity in the future on the site, but there should never be more. Next slide, please. Uh, there was a question about the potential negative impacts to the public from this action. And that was kind of, a, again, asked earlier uh, this afternoon. Uh, you know, the staff's basic understanding uh, with, with very limited uh, ability to do economic analysis, uh, not taking this action could possibly result uh, in more economic activity if new facilities were built or existing facilities were expanded. Uh, there's the potential for more or cheaper energy to be available within the region. Uh, it's unclear the likelihood of either possibility, and we just didn't have the resources, we don't have the resources uh, to, to pursue additional analysis uh, of these questions at this time. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, is there evidence to support the assumption that a new facility would be safer than an existing facility? Uh, and I did ask some of uh, some other uh, organizations within the state uh, if they could help us with this one. The general response seemed to be it's difficult to find evidence to support the assumption that a newly built facility would be safer than the existing facilities. Uh, without this, this um, code amendment, there's a possibility that a site owner uh, would build an expanded facility that meets more rigorous seismic standards. And then with, with this action, with this code amendment, there's a possibility that, that an existing owner would decide not to invest further in a facility, leaving it potentially more seismically vulnerable. Um, you know, I think you could argue that this might come down to, do we wanna have more fuel that's potentially seismically safer or less fuel that's potentially seismically uh, vulnerable, uh, I guess is kind of the the, the, the the short answer to, well, that was not a very short answer, but that's the end answer to the question. Um, it's just, it's hard to weigh weigh that right now. Uh, and, and of course, seismic vulnerability is a, is a hard thing to understand as well. And I believe the next slide is our last question which was a question about where are fossil fuel fuels being utilized that are transported through the city when we see those trains. So the northbound trains are heading to Tacoma, typically, where there's a refinery and storage tanks. Uh, I will note, however, that the moratoriums and proposed bans that are similar to what Vancouver is considering, uh, both in the city of Tacoma and Whatcom County, may eventually impact the number of oil trains going through Vancouver. So that's something uh, just to be aware of, doesn't really have any uh, direct impact on, on what we're proposing here, but there was a question about those trains. So I, uh, I did find that out and uh, wanted to pass that along. So the next slide uh, should take us back to the proposed work plan. Uh, just a reminder, as, as, as was mentioned at the very beginning, uh, we had our, our work session here with the Planning Commission on May 25th. Uh, here I am again with you on, on today, July 7th. Uh, we have a city council workshop to review the same material uh, next Monday, August 2nd, uh, after which we'll initiate the CEPA review. Uh, Planning Commission public hearing currently scheduled for September 14th. And then uh, after that, we'll move on to uh, another council, city council workshop if necessary, and then first reading and public hearing 
uh, later in the fall. So that is the general proposed work plan. And uh, I will turn it back to the chair for any, any further questions. Okay, Commissioner Haroon. Yeah, I, I don't know, Aaron, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by um, that, that we had no staff, staff time or ability or resources to evaluate negative impacts from this. It seems like a pretty big proposal without um, reaching out to the companies affected. Um, we've, we've, we've had nothing presented to us about what the, the five current companies do, what they, um, what they provide to our community. Um, and I don't know if it's just, is it just asphalt products or is it just their, their, their fuel storage for the barges or, you know, are they making stuff with, I, there's, there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, so it's, it seems like I get the feeling of like, Hey, everybody oil's bad, right? So let's just ban it. And without any, without any real indication of what's going on there. And, and I'm, being in the construction industry, I'm reminded of like what happens when Texas shuts down. Um, we can't get, um, it is created a chain reaction. We can't get insulation. We can't get um, conduit. If you want furniture, it's six to nine months out um, because all of the chemicals that are made for all of these things are in Texas. And, um, and so when Texas shuts down, our entire supply chain shuts down. And so, so I kind of have, I really, it concerns me um, about pushing things to the next community um, if we're if we're able to responsibly manage it within our own community. Um, and so that's 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 kind of my where I, I really would like some some more depth there because I, I want to understand how we're affecting people, um, the consumers, and how we're affecting the employment. Um, people there, and I and I, yeah, I, I would really like that. I I appreciate that, and you know we'll continue to to do what we're what we're able to do uh, with with the staff resources we have. Uh, I can tell you, you know, it's it's not asphalt proper uh, asphalt plants that's you know excluded from uh, from the definition. Um, as is as is maritime uh, facilities, so doesn't help doesn't completely answer your question, but at least just want to pass that along and as we continue to do the research. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I'm just I'm just trying to um, if we're going to hearing without having some of these answers, it's I think it's it's important from a public oversight, um, and it, it just seems like. There's the safety element, which which was very much triumphed as it's it's because of you know protecting our water, trout del aquifer, those kind of things. But um, but it really comes across as we just want to make it really hard and expensive to use oil products. And if that's if that's the goal, then I think that should be their first bullet point. Um, because that's an honest way to 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 approach what we're what we're trying to achieve, um, and you know I'm I'm on board you know with with moving to renewables. I'm just trying to get a you know have a, have a have an honest conversation about it. So or I was to able to just to, to make, make, not honest like as you're being dishonest, but a, a complete you know holistic conversation. No, I I, I appreciate that, uh, and I was able to just quickly pull up uh, the research that, that Kayla had done previously. Uh, it looks like the five uh, facilities identified, uh, three of them, well, let's see, I have a bulk terminal, a bulk terminal and pipeline operator, an oil refinery, a natural gas processing facility, and a bulk propane terminal. So those are, those are the five, uh, and, yeah, that's as that's as best we're able to do at this point. Uh, I don't have any answers. Looks like employees were total under twenty employees, as far as we could uh, as far as we could tell from from the research we had done. So um, I think that was a question 
perhaps Commissioner Atkins had asked. So we'll continue that, but just just so you know, kind of what we've been able to find so so far. Thank you, Commissioner Atkins. Yes, I'd just again like to you know reiterate what Commissioner Room said and what Commissioner Shower said earlier. I'm I'm uncomfortable with being asked to impose a moratorium where we, we've never asked what's the what's the ramification of this. I mean, what's the ram? Because it sounds like, I mean, it, it sounds like it's going to make it very difficult for these existing five businesses to stay in business. That if they wanted to expand, consolidate, there's going to be a lot of uh, things that tie them down. And it would seem what what the message would be from this is that the city would just prefer they go away and okay that's fine but those all sound like regional businesses to me um so where do they go and sometimes with these moratorium issues i, I i've traveled to saudi arabia i've traveled to kuwait i mean if our expectation is we're just going to send our energy production and refinement overseas i can tell you they don't have the same sort of environmental rules it's just it's just making the problem go away so you don't have to see it uh, so I, I'm uncomfortable with moratoriums in general, and particularly when we don't have a, a robust conversation about what the ramifications will be. So those are my issues. Commissioner Schulte? Uh, I don't have anything at this time. Commissioner Schauer? Thank you. Aaron, an interesting commentary so far. This moratorium, would you express it as, I think it's not fair to ask you, express it as a climate action initiative or a safety initiative? And I, I understand there's a Venn diagram where those things overlap, but having critical facilities, for example, we would like not to have our operations center in the flood zone, so we're going to move it. We would like to not have our airport uh, at least have one airport in this county outside the seismic flood zone. To me, the characterization of critical infrastructure, fuel, and others outside of a flood or a, even the quake doesn't take it out, does the, does the flood that comes with the quake in a subduction, subduction quake bring critical facilities in danger, right? So I guess maybe this conversation has, for, for me, has been muddled. It would help if I understood the priority or the motivation instinct is we need everything scary and dangerous and critical outside a subduction quake damage zone or is the primary initiative for us to reduce the consumption or the storage of fossil fuels in this community and is that a i don't know if i articulate that very well but in my digestion of this topic and we're making a recommendation to council and our decision makers as I think about how I would characterize it, that which one of those two is the higher calling, if you will, would help me? I think that's a, a great question. Uh, I posed the same question to council and the direction was from them that this is a public health and safety uh, is, is the top priority of this effort, uh, not climate. So if that helps with, with understanding kind of how we've landed on what we've landed on. Uh, that was the direction I received from uh, from our council. So I appreciate that. That's really helpful. I, I, I hearken back to a conversation in this community maybe seven or eight years ago where the FAA was willing to fund the expansion of the Camas Washua Airport to turn it into a legitimate, large-scale, reliable airport. Ultimately, the port didn't do that, but it is the only airport in this community outside the flood zone. Right. So. When we, we as Vancouver, I guess I would, in my duty here, I see our responsibility is not just to Vancouver, but to our region. Are we the only, will this just move to Washougal? <laughs> you know, it, you know, and, and it, 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 it's not a, I'm trying not to make a value judgment around it. I'm trying to understand we don't operate in a vacuum. So um, again, perhaps helping the code when we publicize the hearing we have a hearing, understanding better that we have two priorities, but number one is safety, second is climate, and that we recognize these are critical facilities. But those kinds of things, I think, help take this conversation to something other than we don't want oil. Because I don't think that's a that's 
you can read it that way. I, I, I'm going to be optimistic and suggest that's not exactly our motivation. There's greater calling here to not have this stuff in a danger zone. We don't let we don't let ourselves develop certain things in a wellhead protection zone, for example, right? It's a similar. This is just a currently very charged topic, and um, I'm I'm trying to learn and develop my own either reflection or how I would or how I would contemplate a decision someday. So this this conversation is helpful. And, and I appreciate that distinction. Uh, in some ways, it's unfortunate that I have ended up as the face of both this discussion as well as the climate conversation, because I think it does uh, lead to some uh, cross prop, cross purposes. I you know I actually want to go clarify my previous statement. You know, when I've had conversations with individual counselors about this particular one, and especially the ones who sponsored this uh, in the first place, it was not a health safety is number one and climate is number two. It's health and safety is the reason for doing this, not climate at all. And so they really see this as not a climate play. This is a public health and safety and let's protect uh, against uh, impacts from a seismic event or other uh, secondary event um, impacts on, on public health and safety directly or through the, the aquifers. So just to add a little extra clear, potential clarification. I appreciate it, and I guess foreshadowing a, a growth boundary conversation for us someday, if I was to roll back to 2009, I might suggest a large abandoned quarry might be a good place to store fuel as opposed to on our waterfront, right? So as we as commissioners think about where zoning and critical facilities ought to go in this region, areas that are localized in depressions, when they fail, they have limited damage impact, which I think is what you're saying. On the waterfront, the damage circle is huge, but it could go somewhere else where we can contain it and have a, um, there's no such thing as fail safe. In my view, there is a safe fail, because it will fail under a certain event. And so maybe this commission can grapple with, if not there, where, and if it was gonna happen here and happen safer here than somewhere else where it's unsafe, all those thoughts are rolling through a, a, a very complicated recommendation we might make at some point to a, to a council. So I appreciate your willingness to sort of hear us out. And I appreciate the conversation. Commissioner Pyle. A couple of clarifying questions, Aaron. Uh, on slide 11, you were talking about um, the consolidation or the expansion of facilities and, and what would what would that count as if a facility were to maintain their same you know size but but change the type of fuel that they were storing so if they were changing the use or they were going from handling to storage or to production would how would how would this moratorium treat that uh my understanding is that it would that would be allowed under this. Uh, really comes down to that. Uh, it's it's the it's the storage threat. It's the threshold. It's the it's the two million gallon threshold that's going to uh, trigger and 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 be considered expansion. Change is not as fine. Expansion is what we're uh, not wanting to have. That and Aaron, um, if I could interject here also. Uh, David, you are there. Great. <laughs> Yeah, I am. So, uh, so David Galage, and I'm one of the assistant city attorneys, and I, I've been helping um, Aaron work on this moratorium. Just a couple of points uh, as I've been listening to the conversation. Um, I think it's important to remember that as we're trying to move forward in this process, we're moving from what has been a moratorium, which is just a temporary control, into something that would be a a permanent um, code change. So, to the extent that when you talk about it or think about it coming up before a hearing, it's no longer going to be a moratorium, which is just something that, that is a temporary control. What, you're, what you really want to focus on is uh, a permanent uh, set of regulations. And to the point about you know uh, potential changes between processing or handling, it's really um, when we put the prohibition in place, these would be, um, you know, if something was in excess, it would be a non-conforming use. And typically a non-conforming use is looked at in a land use context as it can be continued so long and it, as it's not intensified or expanded. So if what would be proposed in the change of use would be, would constitute an intensification 
of that land use, then that would not be allowed. Uh, but if there's real, if it's really just you know an apples to apples change, then I, I think, like Aaron said, that that would that would be fine as long as it's not expanding or intensifying the use. If that if that helps you folks. Well, but that also included consolidating. It would include consolidating as long as we're talking about, uh, you know, as Aaron mentioned previously, what's existing, you know, on a site as of the day that this goes into effect, if it's adopted, that those could be consolidated um, and that wouldn't be intensifying the use because all you're doing is taking three things that are in different places and just putting them one together on one site. Uh, what you don't want is somebody, you know, buying up three different companies and then Consult, trying to say they're going to consolidate those. Commissioner Pyle, were, did, did you want to continue your questioning? I, I, I just I want to piggyback a little bit um, without trying to get into global supply chain issues. Um, I, I, Aaron, it would be helpful to understand if there are parts of Vancouver, and this is piggybacking off of Commissioner Shower a little bit, if there are parts or all of Vancouver that we consider particularly vulnerable to um, to these health and safety concerns. My understanding is that all of Vancouver is considered uh, sitting above the aquifer that we pull our drinking water from. So, to varying degrees, obviously, as as previously discussed, it's a little bit harder to model the impacts. You know how far away from a wellhead, but uh, Vancouver lives on its on its water supply. So. Uh, right. Definitely something to keep in mind. So, so you know, let's say that because I, I do hear the the argument a lot that when you put a moratorium in like this, you're just kicking the can down the road. Um, but perhaps that's exactly the goal of of this is is to move these facilities outside of what we believe is a health and safety concern for Vancouver. Is that is that kind of what I'm hearing? I think that's a good way to to summarize it. Um, you know, I I could not speak to what uh, what what suitable spaces some of our potential neighbors or regional uh, neighbors have uh, if they have spaces that are better suited for you know hosting such a facility in terms of the public health and safety aspects. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that you know Vancouver, because of the fact how our drinking water comes from the aquifer we live on, uh, it's, it doesn't lend itself to to wanting to host these type of facilities. Okay, that's all the questions I had. Thanks, Chair. Anybody else have questions? Uh, Commissioner Haroon. Go ahead, Jack. Um, so, I, again, I get a little flummoxed. So, so it's it's not climate; it's public health and safety. Um, so. To me, and and we're it's a blanket moratorium over all of Vancouver, and not just the most vulnerable areas of Vancouver, like where you know specifically for the liquefaction because the sand, you know, the sandy loam that's down there. Um, it seems largely an engineering question for for a public health and safety because the two million gallons seems arbitrary. I mean, it seems more like you know, and this is where it would be nice to get some like engineering input. Like, is it better to have, you know, million, you know, five million gallon tanks than one three million gallon tank? Um, is there, um, you know, is there like better areas to to site these? Like, if somebody wanted to move these sites, and then we get into the consolidation, which which seems like if you were going to consolidate into a new facility, it would be better um, than having four junky old facilities, even if you're going to go over the two million gallons. So just from the the public, the the safety argument starts raising a whole bunch of other questions from an engineering and and practical matter. Um, if that is the actual stated stated goal, and I, and I'm not seeing a lot of crack there so yeah does that make sense um it does i think you know it gets to the the question that was asked previously and that i attempted to to answer of 
there's just it's it's hard to find evidence of can we make is the assumption that that a new facility is actually safer uh the evidence is not readily available of whether that's true and if there's a certain fail point of a seismic event and i will not try to guess what if there is or what that might be uh that it doesn't really matter if it's a new or old or otherwise facility it's it's rupturing um right. but but aaron your last presentation was very specifically saying that the existing facilities were built prior to the understanding of the liquefaction zone right and it, and it was and so so you guys drove that point really hard so i guess i'm pushing back saying you know you know now you're saying that well, we don't actually even know that a new facility would be better than an old facility. And that that just kind of flies in the face of like practical engineering. I'm sure there's there's you know specialists out there in storage tank seismic stuff and what they do. I mean, California has a lot of experience with with you know large oil facilities and seismic. Um so I, I guess that's kind of where I'm, you know, I I, I need I I need something to sink my teeth into here. You know? No, I, I I understand, and uh, we'll we'll keep digging. We'll keep seeing if we can find some evidence. Take a look at it's, California. Uh, it's just coming across very climate and not public safety. Sure. And if climate, then let's then okay, let's go down the climate path. But if it's public safety, then let's answer the engineering questions. Sure. Okay. Yep. So I have some comments um, reflected you, in, you, in some of what the, just a minute, Commissioner Atkins, I'm speaking, please. I just wanted to make some general comments about the discussion we've been having thus far, and then I'll call on you, Commissioner Atkins. I th don't think it's just your presence, Aaron, that causes us to blur the line between health and safety and what is climate change mitigation. Whether it was you or somebody else, I think these two issues uh, would inevitably intersect, and they are tied. And going back to what Commissioner Schulte said about communication and messaging, I think what council will take the action it's going to take, and we will make our recommendation. But at the same time, whenever there's something that impacts this many issues, and there's tons of them around this. I think I would recommend kind of a Q&A. Why are we doing this? What is the purpose? Is it, and maybe there's two purposes, safety. Maybe it's transit, part of a transition away from fossil fuels. And I likely it is a transition given what we know about climate change. But transitions always need some kind of bridge. And I think we've heard some ideas from some of the commissioners this evening about um, a blanket moratorium or something more specific that could be steps between where we're going and where we are and where we're going. And in that transition is when you bring the public along with you. And I don't have any objection against, you know, prohibiting new or large scale fossil fuel storage. I mean, that sounds like a good idea, but everything has implications. So I'd really encourage you and the council to engage a broad section of the community in this issue. And uh, it may not influence the eventual outcome, but it might influence the pace of that outcome. So those are my comments. Commissioner Atkins, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, thank you, Chair. Sorry, I just wanted to piggyback on what Commissioner Arun had, had was the point he was making earlier, which is about new construction techniques, new uh, engineering techniques, may be able to make existing facilities better, but this may prohibit that. Um, and I further just wanted to put a highlighter. If you create a non-conforming use, it's gonna be impossible for these companies to get new financing. So not only might there be new construction and engineering methods that might make it safer, but now we've exacerbated, you know, it, it may have, again, created an unintended consequence by not allowing these five businesses access to capital. We may be sort of putting them in a position where they don't have the funds to do the sort of maintenance they should be doing because we've made them a non-conforming use. So back to uh, Commissioner Shower's point, maybe there's another path that gets us to the same point without 
putting these five businesses in a position where they can't even get access to capital. It's, I, I think it's a it's a good highlight of another uh, potential unintended consequence. So uh, we'll definitely uh, take a look at that. Um, you know, the, the type four review uh, I think is 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 more in line with what is being proposed by both City of Tacoma and, and Whatcom County. So uh, I want to take a further look at that and chat more with the planning staff since we're, we're at the far edges of my uh, planning knowledge here with with just different review types. So uh, we'll chat a bit more about it. If that's if that's a direction we might want to propose going. Chair, Tim Shower. Commissioner Shower. You know, Aaron, um, I don't. This is really uncharted territory for all these agencies and communities trying to figure out how to how to accommodate. I don't, you know, for certain kind. We have the FSEC process, for example, in Washington for large scale energy facilities, and it's a uh, it's a, there's a there's a panel, and then there's a unilateral decision making from the governor. It I suggest type four only because I know it's the highest order of approval in this community. But topics of this magnitude, I guess, makes me think about the size of the sandbox we're in. Is there such a thing as a type five? Can we have a supermajority at council? Is there something? Because it isn't just this kind of thing that's happening, right? There are other kinds of, of large scale fundamental changes to the way we live and operate. Uh, and type four is our highest order. But I, for one, would suggest that topics of this magnitude might warrant us thinking about even a supermajority at council, it's called a type five, or something that is between our current decision criteria and an outright prohibition. And I don't mean to add to your stack of work, uh, but this is, uh, there are going to be, for example, Tri-Cities is going to build two packaged nuclear power plants that are on the edge of technology and that community is struggling. Do we want those here? Well, that might be the low carbon, not low waste, but low carbon solution to energy production. That community struggles with, do we want to have the innovation here or do we want to have it somewhere else? And I think for us, I want this city to be in a position to do what it thought would move the ball forward rather than just push the ball somewhere else. If that's a, that's probably a clumsy way of saying it. And I guess if, Type four wasn't enough. Is there something above that that we could impart that would require a, un a unanimous decision at council or something like that for something of this magnitude? So, and I'll get off my soapbox and leave that topic till next time. So, Aaron, you, you've heard a lot from us. Do you have any comments that you'd like to make, sort of summarizing what you've heard and if you need well, any clarification from us? I don't think I need any clarification. I do appreciate, you know, the comments, the questions and the comments. And I think, and I think the request for additional clarification is helpful. Uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll continue as, you know, as previously noted, this is not the, the last time we'll, I'll be with you talking about this topic. So, you know, I'll continue to, to do analysis and, and develop additional clarity uh, on some of the questions raised um, and some of the assumptions made. So, you know, I do appreciate the opportunity to continue the conversation um and and also i will say you know we'll see what what the, the feedback is from uh the council next monday when when i have this conversation uh you know i will i will note that you know as as i continually referenced you know this is building off of the direction that i received from council on this work so that direction may change and that may shift us in a different conversation by the time uh we're ready for for a public hearing uh in mid-september so more to come, I would say. Okay. Any other questions, comments from the group? Thank you, Aaron. We appreciate our conversation. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your meeting. So we will be on break until we reconvene at 6.30 for the hearing. Thanks, everyone. See you at 6.30. This conference will now be recorded.
I'm <clears throat> going to give a call to CBTV. Okay. Let them know that we're just about ready. Can't believe it's almost August. All right, we're ready to go whenever you are. This is a continuation of the Planning Commission meeting on July 27th, 2021. Earlier this evening, we had two workshop items. First one was an annual review of the comprehensive plan and zoning code text map and the map and text changes. The second one was on updates to the fossil fuel storage regulations. Before we go further this evening, we need to excuse Commissioner Bloffus and then a separate motion to uh, excuse Commissioner Pyle. Yes, this is Commissioner Schulte and I'll make a motion to excuse Commissioner Bloffus from tonight's hearing. There's a second. I'll second, second that. It's been moved by Commissioner Schulte and seconded by Commissioner Haroon to excuse Commissioner Bloffus from tonight's meeting. Please call the roll, Julie. <clears throat> Commissioner Shower. Approved. Commissioner Atkins. Approved. Commissioner Haroon. Approved. Commissioner Schulte. Approved. And Chair Liddell. Approved. Commissioner Bloffus is, ex is excused. And I'll make a second motion to excuse Commissioner Pyle from tonight's hearing also. Okay, is there a second to that motion? I would second it. It's been moved by Commissioner Schulte and seconded by Commissioner Schauer to excuse Commissioner Pyle from this evening's meeting. Please call the roll, Julie. Uh, Commissioner Schauer? Approve. Commissioner Bluffus. Commissioner Atkins? Approved. Commissioner Haroon. Approved. Commissioner Schulte. Approved. And Chair no. Approved. Commissioner Pyle has been excused from this evening's hearing. We'll now move to the community forum. A community forum is held at each meeting of the Planning Commission. During the community forum, the public is invited to provide comments on any issue they wish to discuss including but not limited to those before the Planning Commission in workshop format. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to address the Commission on any interest of con issue of concern. Remarks should be directed to the Planning Commission as a body. Community members who wish to submit lengthy or detailed testimony are encouraged to provide their comments in writing. These can be sent to Planning Commission at cityofvancouver.us. Please note that the community forum is different from testimony provided as part of the public hearing this evening. In the case of public hearings, individuals that wish to testify on the public hearing item will be called upon during the public hearing, not during the community forum. We appreciate and encourage public comment. And now who is our first Speaker Julie? Uh, I'll list the first three people. So we're starting with Jean Avery, and we'll have Heidi, Cody, and then Don Steinke. So we'll have Jean Avery, if you're on the line, please unmute yourself. Yes, good evening. I'm Jean Avery. I'm a resident of Vancouver. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share a few thoughts. 
My comment is regarding the double-sided reality of our climate. On the one side, we see fires, floods, and droughts, a planet in distress. On the other side, we see climate action plans being developed by the city of Vancouver, the port of Vancouver, and Clark Public Utilities. As National Geographic poignantly summarized earlier this year, we could either lose the planet or we could save the world. Please use your decision-making authority to promote a cleaner, greener future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next up, Heidi Cody. Good evening, everyone. My name is Heidi Cody and I live in Vancouver. If Zenith ignoring Portland's fossil fuel infrastructure ban teaches us anything, it's that if you give oil and gas companies an inch, they can take three million and one miles and keep going. I think the concern voiced earlier tonight to solicit testimonials about how five local fossil fuel companies might be impacted by a ban is misplaced. We're not trying to put them out of business, we're preventing them from expanding, which is exactly what needs to happen as we transition to renewable energy. I would also say that renewable natural gas is not efficient, will delay the transition to clean renewable energy sources like wind and solar, and that harnessing the fumes from Vancouver's wastewater plant for RNG smacks of desperation. I have been advocating on these issues for several years now, and there are a couple of subtexts I keep coming back to. The first has to do with health and safety. No matter what happens fossil fuel infrastructure-wise here locally, we are still in the Cascadian subduction zone and overdue for a catastrophic earthquake. Large-scale fossil fuel companies do not belong here, even though several projects are established already. We could experience a huge fire or explosion from a wrecked train or an oil spill in the Columbia that could devastate our aquifer, waterfront, and wildlife. The second subtext is cost. Some folks will argue that Vancouver will be losing business if we make a fossil fuel ban here permanent. I disagree. I say that the cost of a few lost jobs, particularly toxic jobs, is nothing. Nothing compared to the cost of a billion dollar plus cleanup should something go wrong here. Oil is not inherently bad, but our continued resilient reliance on fossil fuels is now jeopardizing our future. The summer has already made clear that the climate crisis is here. The temperatures are so high, they scorched evergreen trees across our state. In your workshop, someone asked how the city is going to sell a fossil fuel ban to the citizens here. I have to say, Vancouver's citizens, myself included, have consistently been telling the port in the city that we do not want any more large fossil fuel infrastructure here. That is what we are telling you again tonight please establish a permanent ban on expanding and new bulk fossil fuel projects here in Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is Don Steinke and we'll follow that up with Teresa Hardy. Hello everyone, I'm Don Steinke. The Western States Petroleum Association is the master of spin and muddle. The gas industry is even better. Do you not know that demand for fossil fuels is declining and that recently passed legislation in Olympia will accelerate the adoption of EVs and heat pumps and the fossil fuel industry will have excess capacity? Clean air and public safety is a good reason to prevent the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. I hope you read the headlines in the two sightline articles I sent a week ago. The Williams Pipeline Company kept their employees in the dark regarding the risks, and both the regulators and the industry kept the public in the dark about the explosion of their LNG plant in Plymouth, Washington, seven years ago. My colleagues and I defeated 20 giant fossil fuel export terminals between Coos Bay and Whatcom County. Speaking of Whatcom County, my friends there have been working for five years to ban the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. And tonight, right now, the county council up there will vote to force stricter regulations of any expansion of the fossil fuel facilities. And the backers there are confident that they have the votes to pass it. They say the oil industry is not expected to black 
to block it. That's a nice surprise because the refineries there spent $32 million in opposition to ballot measure 1631 for clean energy in 2018. Now at least one of them, British Petroleum, supported the Climate Commitment Act, which is like an improved version of the ballot measure. They appear to be responding to shareholder pr pressure. In my recent email, I answered all the questions you asked and discussed the fact that in the event of a worst case accident, we'd likely be stuck with most of the cost of the $6 billion, according to the consultant hired by the city of Vancouver. I urge you to recommend to council that the moratorium be made permanent as is and for them to do so before the end of the year. And regarding section 30, I hi highly recommend that before pavement is poured, that conduit for EV charging plugs should be provided for almost all parking lot spaces, particularly for residential, and that all roofs be made solar ready and with conduit, and that no gas furnaces or gas water heaters be allowed. And for the HP jobs, think ma mainly about public transit for those commuters. Regarding the recent comments by the commission, renewable hydrogen is not a fossil fuel, neither is gas from wastewater or in landfills. Demand for fossil fuels will decrease, the trend is toward EVs and the federal and state policy will accelerate that. So will the automakers. Economies of scale and innovation means the price falls steadily. Stop re repeating the spin of the fossil fuel industry. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Uh, next up we have Teresa Hardy and then we'll follow up with Thomas McGiffin. Um, good evening, um, my name is Teresa Hardy and I'm a resident of Vancouver. I'm speaking tonight as another concerned um, citizen of Vancouver to um, ask you to continue to recommend and support the moratorium as is. I'm another voice for what we want. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Thomas McGiffin, you're on the line. Don't know that I saw anyone with that name listed on the caller list. Um, so next up, we'll have Catherine Judy, and then uh, lastly, Dan Sarah's. Uh, good evening. Um, attending the workshop earlier, I'm wondering how um, much the commissioners actually read and digest um, some of the materials that have been submitted, which address over and over again the safety risks and the unintended consequences of bulk facilities that this moratorium is intended to um, prevent and the intent of our council. One of the questions asked had to do with um, the oil trains and it's not just the bulk facilities here that need to be managed or um, have unintended consequences, it's the trains that are coming through and any bulk facility would have um, uh, volatile um, product coming in on um, trains that um, are now being understaffed and the length of the trains is longer. We know this from um, recent um, publications about what the railroads are doing. And as far as unintended consequences are concerned, I would ask the citizens of Mosher whether if they had an opportunity to prevent those oil trains or an increase in oil trains coming through, what their answer would be. As far as um, selling it to the community, this community spent years um, preventing an oil terminal, a bulk facility being located at our port. I don't think that this needs to be a sell. Um, I um, would also pay attention as uh, Don did to um, an area of the state that's been a hub for the fossil fuel industry for decades. That's the Cherry Point um, location in Whatcom County. Their local county is poised to become the first in the country to ban new fossil fuel infrastructure through changes to the land use code and they're doing it just as we speak. Um, the, uh, what's been happening in Whatcom County for the last 10 years and in the state of or and Oregon is that 
in our state and Oregon is that people have been saying no to these proposals coming forward one by one by one and people are winning. It's an example of a community coming together and saying, you know what, we're done with fossil fuel expansion and we really want our elected representatives and our appointed planning commissions to put in place ground rules that let the industry now we're done with the expansion we're done with taking the risks that come with these kinds of facilities and the uninsurable unintended consequences that we just don't want here in our area and also along our river um, and we do want clean water and we want our aquifer protected and we appreciate that the city councils asked you to um, return an ordinance that reflects the um, resolution that they uh, put in front of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last up we have Dan Serres. Chair Liddell, members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I'm Dan Sears. I'm the conservation director for Columbia Riverkeeper. I'm also the policy uh, coordinator for the Power Pass Frack Gas Coalition. And on behalf of Columbia Riverkeeper and our many members in Vancouver, I just want to thank you for the work you're doing on the city's moratorium on large scale fossil fuel facilities. The city of Vancouver is standing up for the health and safety of its residents when it holds the line on these new massive fossil fuel facilities on the scale that was previously proposed by DeSoro Savage and Catherine Chuddy uh, just spoke about that. Oil train terminals, coal terminals, LPG and LNG train terminals, these types of developments impose major risks and offer few, if any, benefits to Vancouver neighborhoods. Uh, really, the city is, is wise to steer clear of these dead-end projects. Other communities nearby have experience with large-scale fossil fuel facilities, and their experience is increasingly negative as the, as the risks begin to become more clear. Yesterday, Multnomah County and the city of Portland released a study showing that the risks of fossil fuel storage facilities are enormous and they have implications for the entire region. In a large Cascadia subduction zone event, seismic event, Portland's energy hub puts our region at risk for one of the largest oil spills in history on par with the Deepwater Horizon because of the significant quantities of fossil fuel stored in tank farms in Portland. Obviously, this impacts Vancouver as well. According to the report, after three days uh, post-event, between 18.6 million and 37.4 million gallons of oils could still remain in the water out of an initial in-water release of uh, between 40 and 80 million gallons. I draw your attention to this fossil fuel hub problem because all forms of fossil fuels pose risks for health, safety, climate, and environment. But our region faces unusually high risks from these terminals already. With this in mind, your work in making permanent Vancouver's fossil fuel moratorium is all the more important. We know that the transition away from fossil fuels will take time and effort, but we can begin together by not expanding or establishing new large-scale fossil fuel infrastructure to support fossil fuel processing, handling, and storage. If a company wants to improve the resiliency, the resilience of a facility within the existing footprint and capacity of what they already own, nothing in the proposed policy would alter that. Uh, and the, the policy goes out of its way to not impinge on local distribution of, of energy and fuels, but really is looking at things more on the scale of what we saw with the Tesoro Savage oil train terminal. Um, that's really what we're trying to get at with, with our support for this, um, this really important uh, policy as, it, as it's written. Um, and finally, sort of as an example, I just wanted to update the commission on an oil train issue uh, that affects Vancouver. Um, the trains- please do, please do so succinctly, your time is up. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, I don't have a clock here, so I, I missed that. Um, I'll just briefly say that uh, the oil trains that go to the Zenith oil train terminal um, in Portland come through Vancouver. And it's a good example of how a facility once established, and, and Zenith used to be an asphalt facility, um, it was sort of dusted off by new owners and converted to an oil train facility. Um, and 
those trains pose a really significant risk to Vancouver neighborhoods. And I just wanted to say that your action in Vancouver really <laughs> represents you carrying a lot of the weight. And um, I, I think that- Okay, I, I will cut you off there. We get the point, thank you. You got it, okay, thank you so much. Is there anyone else on the line who wishes to speak? If not, the community forum is closed. I will now open the public hearing on the commercial and transient lodging use classification code change. The role of the Planning Commission is to review and analyze proposed ordinances comprehensive plan amendments, zoning code changes, and other land use related issues. We follow a public process, including holding hearings, during which the public has an opportunity to provide additional perspectives. In legislative matters, the role of the com commission is advisory. The city council will hold separate hearings, consider our recommendation, and make a final determination. The planning commission will conduct a public hearing tonight and take testimony regarding the matter being considered. Community members who are registered by noon today will be called upon to address the Planning Commission during the public testimony portion of the hearing. When you are called, please unmute your phone or microphone and state your name for the record. If you are providing the formal recommendation of a neighborhood association or other group, please tell us when the association voted on the matter, as well as how many people were for and against. Please keep remarks brief. Remarks should be directed to the Planning Commission as a body. Please do not repeat testimony already provided. As a reminder to my colleagues, please indicate to the chair when you want to be recognized. At the conclusion of the public testimony, the commission will deliberate and make a recommendation to council. Would anyone on the Planning Commission like to disclose any conflicts of interest? Before we begin the hearing, please ensure that your microphones are turned off and muted during the presentation. Please show respect for the people testifying, whether you agree with them or not. Rebecca, do you have any introductory comments? I do briefly, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to contextualize this, remind the commission and those listening that we did hold a workshop on this item uh, on May 25th. No, excuse me, on um, it was June 8th. June 8th, thank you, on June 8th. And um, the largely discussion was um, about coming into alignment with recently passed state regulations. So um, that's the, the, the broader context. Um, and I'll turn it over to Greg Turner, who's our land use manager, to, to do the presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, as uh, Rebe Rebecca said, you saw this on June 8th at a workshop. Um, this is a commercial and transient lodging code change uh, public hearing. Next slide, please. So a presentation overview, I'm gonna go over the background and the current code language, uh, the Washington State House Bill 1220, and then the recommended action. Next slide, please. To provide you with some background, in uh, 2018, council passed an ordinance integrating human service uses into similar commercial uses in the development code. Um, at that time, we had uh, the city had its own human service facilities ordinance. Um, so anything that met that criteria was uh, kind of went through its own process. Um, but in 2018, uh, we took each one of those human service facility uses and put them into similar uh, use classifications. So the um, with the homeless shelters, those went into the commercial and transient lodging use classification. Um, and this was initiated due to concerns with the applicable laws that prohibited discrimination against people based on familial status or disabilities, including the Civil Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, and a ruling in the Federal Court of Appeals. Next slide, please. So the code uh, currently reads, uh, as you see on the slide, um, uh, for the commercial lodging use classification says commercial and transient lodging, residential facilities such as hotels, motels, rooming houses, bed and breakfast establishments, and homeless shelters where tenancy is typically less than one month may include accessory meeting, 
convention facilities and food preparation services. Um, this shows you what was changed uh, back in 2018. So uh, what's uh, underlined is what was added and then it was, uh, what was what is struck out is what was taken out. Next slide, please. So the term uh, where tenancy is typically less than one month was already in the commercial lodging use classification at the time. Uh, more recently, the Vancouver Housing Authority purchased a hotel uh, by Vancouver Mall to be used as a homeless shelter. Um, at that time, plan the planning official was asked to do a code interpretation by a, a neighboring property owner relative to the term typically um, and, 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 uh, as it relates to the less than one month. Um, as it applies to the use classification context. Uh, the code, code interpretation um, that the planning official issued uh, stated that typically recognizes most homeless shelter individuals would stay less than one month as, as uh, what happened with uh, hotel use. Um, and that code interpretation is currently under, under appeal and is pending the outcome of this code change. Next slide, please. Uh, recent Washington state legislation uh, passed requiring cities to treat transitional housing or permanent supportive housing the same as hotels. Um, cities are required to comply uh, by September 30th, 2021. And the current code language uh, that we have in our code is inconsistent with the state legislation as it further creates a barrier to the siting of homeless shelters within the city. Next slide, please. And then additionally, additionally, the use of terms regarding the length of stay in homeless shelters is outdated as most homeless individuals do not have the ability to move out of shelters within a specific time frame. Next slide, please. So the recommended action um, that uh, Planning Commission, we'd like Planning Commission to forward on to City Council is to make the following change, is to strike the language where tenancy is typically less than one month. Um, so that if uh, somebody comes in with a homeless shelter, um, they wouldn't have that uh, provision. Um, we would just treat it as a homeless shelter and, and consider it under the commercial and transient lodging category as we would with hotels, motels, and the like. Next slide, please. So the next steps uh, after planning commission is to go to city council for, for our first reading on August 9th. 2021, and then a public hearing with uh, City Council August 16th. Next slide, please. That ends the presentation, unless there's uh, questions or discussion that the Planning Commission would like to have. Okay. Uh, Julie, are there people signed up to speak this evening? I didn't have anyone who had registered <clears throat> to speak for testimony during the hearing. So is there anyone on the line who would like to offer testimony on this topic? If not, public testimony is closed. So I'll go around and ask commissioners if you have questions for Mr. Turner. Commissioner Schauer. I have none. I feel very uh, comfortably educated based on the last workshop and the staff presentation. The uh, changes seem um, very logical and consistent with the direction the city wants to move and state law, so I'm supportive. Commissioner Schulte? Yes, uh, I don't have any questions at all. Thank you. Commissioner Haroon? I have no questions. Commissioner Atkins? Commissioner Atkins, are you there? Do we show that he's on the line? Oh, Hello. go ahead, Commissioner Hello. Atkins. Uh, no, I, I have I have no questions. Thank you. Okay, I have no questions either. I think the uh, recommendation is consistent with the comp plan, and I think removing the qualifying language is a good idea. So now we need to forward a motion to City Council. Would anyone like to make that motion? This is, this is Commissioner Schulte, and I will um, make the motion. Let me start. Uh, I'll make a motion with respect to the commercial and transient lodging code section to eliminate the words where tenancy is typically less than one month. 
Okay. Is there a second? I will second that, Commissioner Haroon. It's been moved by Commissioner Schulte and seconded by Commissioner Haroon to forward a recommendation to City Council regarding uh, Vancouver Municipal Code 20.160.020.C.1, commercial and, and transient lodging, residential facilities such as hotels, motels, rooming houses, bed and breakfast establishments, and homeless shelters may include accessory meeting, convention facilities, and food preparation and service. This strikes the, the, the phrase where tenancy is typically less than one month. Please call the roll, Julie. Commissioner Shower. Approved. Commissioner Atkins. Approved. Commissioner Haroon. Approved. Commissioner Schulte. Approved. And Chair Liddell. Approve. It is approved unanimously with five votes in favor. This concludes the public hearing. Is there any further business we need to bring forward, Rebecca? No, there's not. That's all for tonight. Thank you, Commission, for your time. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.